Good afternoon. My name is Derek Allridge, and I am a professor in the Curry School of Education and Human Development, where I also serve as the director of the Center for Race and Public Education in the South and the director of the Teachers in the Movement Project. Welcome and thank you all for joining us for our second installment of the Teachers in the Movement webinar series. This series was born as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic and our team's continuing efforts to find new ways of sharing these important oral histories. In an effort to both continue our work and engage with friends and supporters, the Teachers in the Movement Project team is hosting a webinar series which provides audiences the opportunity to join the team in viewing and discussing some of our most notable interviews. Our first webinar is available in the video library on the Teachers in the Movement website. Today, we are thankful to have co-sponsors for this webinar, including the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, Richmond Organizing Branch, Osala of Central Virginia, Desegregation of Virginia Education, also known as Dove, and AARP Virginia. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with the Teachers in the Movement Project, uh, it was born in 2014 when a group of students and I decided to collect the narratives of teachers involved in civil rights. Over the past six years, our team has grown and has finally tuned our vision to interview teachers and educators who taught between 1950 and 1980, who espouse ideals of equality, democracy, self-determination, and freedom through their pedagogy. To date, the team has conducted several hundred interviews with educators in five states, uh, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. And contrary to the idea among some scholars that teachers were not, not actively involved in civil rights, our project operates from the premise that teachers played an integral role uh, in the movement. For example, not only as members of civil rights organizations like the NAACP, but also as teachers in the classroom. For today's webinar, we will view and discuss selections of interviews from legendary Virginia educators. They include Johnny Fullerwander of Danville, Virginia, Laverne Spurlock of Richmond, Virginia, Owen Carwell of Lynchburg, Virginia, and Carolyn Mosby of Richmond, Virginia. We have several panelists here today who will guide our discussion. And let's turn it over to them and let them introduce themselves. Greetings. My name is Carmen Foster, and I serve as a research associate and a consultant with Teachers of Movement. Professor Aldridge was my dissertation chair at the Curry School for my research regarding school desegregation in Richmond. I was part of the first wave of Black students to desegregate the Richmond public schools in the early 1960s. Along with my keen interest as a public historian, I've been able to merge the uses of history in the work that I do as an executive coach and a leadership development consultant. Hello, everyone. My name is Michelle Evans Oliver. I am a native Richmonder. I grew up in the Richmond public school system. I am a financial advisor by trade and the current president of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. I also love history and genealogy. Thanks for having me. Hello everyone. My name is Danielle Wingfield Smith. I'm a postdoctoral research scholar um, with Dr. Allrich in the Center for Race and Public Education in the South, uh, and also the Associate Director for the Teachers in the Movement Project. And I'm elated to be able to engage in this conversation today with you all. Good afternoon. My name is Alexis Johnson, and I'm a second year doctoral student in the Social Foundations of Education program at the University of Virginia School of Education. And I serve as a graduate research assistant with the Teachers in the Movement Project, as well as the Center for Race and Public Education in the South. So before we begin, I want to encourage the audience to please ask questions in the Q&A box if something piques your interest please include your name and any affiliation with your question. We hope to answer as many questions or comments as we can at the conclusion of our discussion. Um, so to set the context for today's discussion, I want to get, begin by asking the panelists to discuss the unique place of Virginia in civil rights educational history. Well, I can um, jump in here with some brief remarks. Um, so my research explores 
systems of educational injustice and laws that influence those systems. And so I am a native of Prince Edward County, Virginia. And one of the things that really makes Virginia a unique place is that it is the um, one of the, of the places, birthplaces of Brown, the Board of Education. It has its roots right in Prince Edward County, Virginia, where educator Barbara Johns um, was at the center of the Davis V County School Board of Prince Edward um, County case. And so that's a very unique part about Virginia. Uh, it's also where major movement leaders were born, um, like Barbara Johns and Oliver Hill and others. And so we really begin to see some founda foundational strategies begin to emerge in Virginia. So it's definitely uh, a state of uh, the Commonwealth that's worthy of our discussion today. Time in behind Danielle, because I think it is really important to understand uh, Prince Edward County, particularly as the heartbeat of what was going on in Virginia, because the Brown decision in 1954 was a collection of five separate cases bundled together that was sponsored by the NAACP. Um, but what was interesting about Davis versus the County School Board of Prince Edward was it was the only case of protest that originated, I'm sorry, that originated from student protests. Barbara Johns was a critical figure, I think, in Virginia history. She was just 16 years old when she was at the Robert Russell Moton High School in 1951. But what was more interesting was she was the niece of Reverend Vernon Johns, who was the pastor of Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama, prior to Martin Luther King. But makes a lot of this significant is that finally, Virginia has recognized the significance of both the Brown decision and Prince Edwards's role in it. As you'll see that there's a Virginia civil rights statute featuring Barbara and the students on the grounds of the state capitol, along with recognition for Oliver Hill and Spotswood Robinson. Thank you. One, one reason that I was interested in us focusing on Virginia and, and particular, and particularly Virginia educators is because when we think about popular images of the civil rights movement, we typically think about uh, uh, Alabama, Mississippi, uh, and Arkansas. And, uh, you know, before I moved here in 2011, one of the questions that uh, I was asked by my colleagues who taught at, at, at the University of Georgia is, you, you study the civil rights movement, is there civil rights history in Virginia? <laughs> and that was something that I thought was just a hilarious question because, I mean, it was the heart of the Confederacy, right? And so there was certainly uh, a civil rights history here. And I wanted us to focus on Virginia because you don't have as much scholarship up there on Virginia as you do, uh, you know, Birmingham, I mean, as Alabama, Mississippi, and other places. So um, we wanted to focus here. I do want to give a shout out to some people who have published some important work in this uh, in this area, uh, particularly uh, Larnette Lee, uh, Brian Doherty, Jill Titus, Peter Wallerstein, and of course my students Karma Foster, uh, Danielle Wingfield Smith, Alex Hires, and Lindsey Jones. So there is a growing body of research, and there are plenty of other people I didn't name in the historiography right now. But I think uh, Virginia is very deserving of further study in civil rights. So. That's why we chose Virginia. You know, I think it's also helpful to recognize the power of the massive resistance movement that occurred during Brown because of Senator uh, Harry F. Byrd and his segregated political machine. Uh, when I think about the mouthpiece of the movement, which was really a Richmond news leader right in the heart of the state capitol that was led by James J. Kilpatrick, at the time, it was a media way to rally those segregationist troops in a way. What I thought was interesting was it influenced the governor to close the public schools in Charlottesville, Norfolk, and Warren County, rather than to um, comply with the 1954 Supreme Court order. And what I really find interesting was that the state Supreme Court and a federal judge panel ruled that those school closures violated the Constitution, and they rendered their decision on January 19, 1959, ironically, the birth date of General Robert E. Lee. Wow. Great. Okay. 
Alrighty. Well, thank you everyone um, for enlightening us on the unique role of Virginia in civil rights education history. Um, it's certainly going to help us as we turn now to viewing the clips of some of the um, legendary Virginia educators. Um, so in this first segment um, entitled Jim Crow Schooling, um, we, we often hear the narratives of former educators um, when we conduct these um, interviews um, speak highly of their experiences attending uh, segregated all-black schools. And the narratives that we hear challenge a commonly held belief that segregated all-black schools were inferior compared to all-white schools of the time. So let's listen in as Dr. Laverne Spurlock describes her teachers at Armstrong High School in Richmond. This is Edwina Sharp Clay. I think Clay was her last name. And uh, Mr. Christopher Foster was the chemistry teacher. Uh, Mrs. Eloise Bowles Washington was the physics teacher. I think that was kind of unusual for the lady to be the physics teacher in that day and time, but she was. Uh, I don't know how I could have ever forget the famous English teacher, Mrs. Mary. Jane Wingfield Payne, and she always said her whole name to us. She was the one who made sure we knew something about debating. We debated in her class in our senior year. Uh, Mr. Virginius Carney taught us Latin. Uh, Mrs. Emma Davidson was the French teacher. And, uh, and Mrs. Geneva Kent was our Latin teacher. Uh, Mrs. Helen, Mrs. Hattie Gaston was our biology teacher. Mrs. Clara Brown was our general science teacher. And how could we forget that legendary coach, Maxie Robinson, he taught history. I do not recall his being that much into civil rights or anything of that sort as a history teacher. Then Mr. Benjamin Franklin Kersey also was uh, a history teacher. He taught the 11th grade history, United States history. And oh, did we love her, but she was just so perfect for it. Mrs. Susie B. Lewis taught us government. Mr. Joseph Ransom, who was a legendary person in this area, taught us Negro history. It was not required but everybody took it because we all loved Mr. Ransom. Tell us more about Mr. Dr. Ransom, wasn't he or Mr. No, Ransom? he was always Mr. Ransom. He later became a principal okay. at uh, Randolph School. Tell us more about Mr. Ransom Mr. and what he yeah. taught you in yes. terms of Negro oh, history. Oh, he was perfect. He was just perfect. Uh, we learned things about how people in Africa lived, what their uh, just what their being was and how they thought, how they acted, how they worked with each other and their values. He taught us so much about the values of Africans that were lost once uh, the immigration, not by design, took place. But uh, Mr. Ransom taught us all of the little things that were not in the books. Our book was thin like that. We strayed from the book quite often because Mr. Ransom was a reservoir of information about how Blacks, the story of the Negro retold by Carter G. Woodson. That was the name of the book. Oh, you're calling on my memory today. <laughs> Great. All right, what a wonderful, wonderful clip. Um, so there's two things that stand out to me with this one. And um, one is hearing um, Dr. Spurlock discuss the liberal arts curriculum um, that was used at Armstrong High. And the other um, kind of a, a, a follow-up point to that is um, her discussing Mr. Ransom and um, teaching African history and even discussing the textbook. So I'm just, just 
um, it is just wonderful to hear uh, about the curriculum during this time. And even just her able to recall all of those teachers just really speaks to the, the impact and how important these teachers were. So panelists, do you all have um, any comments on this clip? Oh, I do because um, I was so grateful to interview Dr. Spurlock. Um, we have a long family history going back, so I was really excited. You know, when she started talking about the list of teachers at Armstrong, I have to tell you, it sent tingles through my heartstrings. Because see, Armstrong High School was the mothership, okay? That was a mothership before the other mothership, you know, of Black um, Richmond education. Um, Armstrong, when she went to school, was located in Jackson Ward at Prentice and Lee Street, across from what's now the Black History Museum from 1923 to 1951. My dad was a 1937 grad who told me that there were two shifts of teachers that um, taught two sets of students in one day, but yet they were still paid less than the white teachers at that time. Um, you know, black teachers at Armstrong were amazing. I can understand why she would remember them and recall them so well. Um, half of those teachers she mentioned had graduate degrees. In fact, I reviewed the credentials of Richmond High School teachers in 1960 that were at Armstrong. 55% of the teaching staff had master's degrees. 51% in 1960, Maggie Walker had them too. Those numbers were higher than the white high schools in Richmond, John Marshall and TJ. Many of the faculty also had gone to Virginia Union or Virginia State for undergrad, and then they went to, um, and then they went on for graduate education outside of Virginia because uh, Alice Jackson had um, threatened to sue the state of Virginia when they would not let her go to graduate school at University of Virginia. Alice's efforts uh, put the legislature into a special session so that if you were black and had an undergraduate degree, you could go on for postgraduate education as long as you did not go in the state of Virginia. So there was so much nurturing and caring for those teachers and the scholarly preparation of those teachers I think was really noteworthy. Um, the teachers that she described, I remember, were considered as heroes and sheroes, exemplars in our community. And I heard about them all the time on Sunday family dinners. In fact, Eloise Bowles Will to Washington that she mentioned who taught physics, she would join us for Thanksgiving dinner for many years. You can see I'm excited when she started talking about them. You know, that's, that's very interesting, Carmen, because when I look at, when I see Ms. Spurlock talking, I think about my father and my father actually graduated from Armstrong High School in the class of 1945. And he was one of the reasons why I am who I am today. As he spoke, to, as Miss Spurlock spoke, I thought about him speaking at home and talking about the different teachers. Even though I was a little baby, um, he would do that. And she spoke about Dr. Carter G. Woodson. And every time anyone talks about Dr. Carter G. Woodson, I get excited as he was the founder of ASALA, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. He, she talked about the story of the Negro retold. And what Carter G. Woodson would do is he would write books and he would send literature to teachers all over the United States so that he could tell the story of how we were Re retelling the story because of the stories that were out there were false. Um, he was very adamant about teaching students and he would actually send lesson plans to, um, to teachers and teachers would send stamps to him so that he can send that, their lesson plans to him. That book was written in 1935. The book speaks about the Negro in Africa, slavery fully developed, the Negro and the Civil War. It's so many chapters in, the, in that book. So it just reminds me of growing up in a household with parents who talked about civil rights and Dr. Spurlock really, really impacted his life, her life, and all the other lives of students who went to Armstrong. Mm -hmm. well, I can't say much beyond what my colleagues have said other than to say I was happy to hear Dr. Uh, Spurlock mention uh, uh, the fact that uh, Mr. Ransom used Woodson's um, work 
particularly the story of the Negro retold. As we know, as Michelle has already said, uh, Woodson was the teacher's teacher. And uh, Woodson spent very little time at, uh, in higher education as a professor. Most of his time was um, devoted to developing materials for teachers to use uh, in, the, in, in their classroom. So that was an important piece. And I couldn't help but um, uh, think about something or pull something off my shelf when I heard Dr. Spurlock talking again about uh, Woodson's book. And this is an earlier book by Woodson, an original copy of Negro Makers of History. Uh, and this copy was on, believe it or not, by W.E.B. Du Bois. And um, Woodson looked at Black history as a form of emancipatory pedagogy. And I think if you, if you, if you, if you consider that what he was doing in his time, putting forth ideas about emancipatory pedagogy, that would train the future generation of civil rights activists and educators. So I think that was a very important point. point that Dr. Um, uh, Spurlock made. All righty, thank you so much, panelists. Um, so we're gonna turn to um, our second segment, um, which is on faculty desegregation. So in Master Narratives of the Civil Rights Movement, we often hear the stories of the incredibly heroic students who desegregated all white schools. But in the following clips, we will hear Mrs. Johnny Fullerwinder and Dr. Carolyn Mosby describe what it was like to desegregate all white schools as teachers. The damn public school system. What was that experience like? Ooh, it was. It, it was shocking. And the interesting thing is I didn't know that I was going to be the one to integrate it. The interview never suggested that I would be put in a position of that nature. So the first day that I entered a big faculty meeting, it was in the cafeteria, tables were around uh, the room, saw like a big red table. There were 150 staff and teachers and the teachers. I walked in and sat down and started examining the materials of the first of school. And then I looked up and I decided to see, you know, what other black teachers were in the room with me? And to my amazement, there were none. I was the only one. It was like, uh, am I dreaming? I mean, if this really happened, where are all the other black teachers that were supposed to be here? I don't recall anybody telling me that I was going to be so like, I called it a test case. We were seated by departments. So the people in my department were sort of cordial to me. But the others had nothing to do with them whatsoever. I don't know if they were ignoring me or they too were in shock because I'm not sure that they had been warned of my coming. There was nothing in the newspaper about the fact that they were going to send a black person to George Washington High School. Nothing in the news media whatsoever. The only time later on my name has ever been mentioned, I was referred to as a Negro science teacher. My name had never been put in the newspaper. But when I realized as I was by myself, I just stood there shocked for a while, trying to figure out what in the world was going on. Is this for real? Am I actually dreaming? When the meeting ended, most of the teachers got up and just sort of went in their own direction. Nobody came to me to say anything to me. The administration apparently was involved in taking care of whatever they needed for the next activity. And none of them came up to me. So I just kind of felt that with this stress, I need to get away somewhere to myself and just kind of unwind. So I went into the restroom. When I went into the restroom, there were two teachers in there ahead of me. I spoke. They did not. When they looked and saw me, they heard and washed their hands and left the restroom very quickly. I kind of walked around the building for a while. And to my shock, I was the only black person I saw in that entire building for that day. Before I left, I Wow. So this interview was conducted, if I remember correctly, in 2015. And the interview was actually um, scheduled or organized, uh, set up by uh, one of my undergraduate students named Chantel White, who is uh, all, also from Danville, Virginia. Now, let me say that I've read quite a bit about, um, re I've read a lot. I've read a, quite, a, quite a bit about Danville civil rights, but I didn't know much about what teachers um, were doing. 
I read some about Mrs. Fullerwine, and I was very impressed, but I was very nervous about doing the interview. So did a little background on it, and this is kind of a methodological, ish, uh, methodological approach that we take. We capture as much background information as we can. And I learned that she was a member of AKA sorority. So when I went to her house, I saw things in her house that kind of confirmed that she was a member of AKA. And I also learned that her husband was a member of Omega Psi Phi. So once I mentioned these things to her, uh, it made me more comfortable. And I think it paved the way for us having a great conversation. So that's what some scholars in qualitative research call building rapport. Uh, but in any case, uh, Mrs. Fullerwinder, um, when she, as she recounted that story, in some ways I could tell that it was a, a painful experience. But one thing that she, she told us was that failure was not an option for her and that she knew that what she was doing uh, was going to pave the way for many other teachers who were desegregating white schools, uh, predominantly white schools or de desegregated schools throughout the South. She thought that originally that she was going to teach at the all Langston High School, all black Langston High School in Danville. But when she arrived in Danville, they told her that she was going to be at George Washington High School. And she recounted her experiences as you just seen. But over time, she told me that the students, the white students and the white teachers uh, had to give her a due respect because she was just a great teacher. And uh, over time, uh, you know, they gave her respect and she paved the way for other educators, uh, African-American educators in Danville. So that was one of my, one of my favorite interviews. And um, so I'll stop here because I want to talk some more about what she told me in the interview later. All right, panelists, do you have any um, other commentary on Mrs. Uh, Fullerwinder before we listen to um, Dr. Mosby's account? Tell me what that experience was like being transferred from Blackwell to John Marshall. Well, I tell you, I went there happy to go to the high school because I liked older students. And I had no idea I was the only Black. So the first day you go and you go to the teacher's room where everybody's assembled. And I walked in looking for some black folk, and they weren't there. And then I made the deadly mistake of looking at somebody who was suntanned and starting toward them and thinking that I had a kindred soul there, and I was waved off, no, no. And that's when I realized I was alone. That was when I realized I was alone. Describe the, atmosphere. was there tension, the atmosphere at John Marshall? I found that folks, um, except in the early childhood things in Lynchburg, when a few white threw rocks at us and called us the N-word, once you get out of the world, no one ever really shows you the racism to your face. And that was polite, how you do it, polite. Everything was so polite. It was stilted polite. Uh, the head of the math department was more than gracious. Everybody just more than gracious. And then when I showed up for homeroom, there was a big red swastika painted in red dripping paint over the door that I entered to go to my homeroom. And then when I unlocked my homeroom door, there was literature at the side door. One was recipe for instant N-I-G-G, mm -hmm. and the other was boat ticket back to Africa. Now that wasn't the only time the literature was under my door, because you know, I got the paint off the building or whatever. But then when the students came, there were already black students there because some of the students that were from your class and era and time. It transferred from Chandler to John Marshall. And the black students who were already there were like relieved or so happy to see me. 
and would come by and speak and were gracious and lovely. Then there were some white students who were very gracious and lovely, but a lot of them just stared and viewed me with great suspicion. And they weighed everything that I said very heavily. It was um, not very comfortable for a while. Then after a while, I think I became a little assertive about almost everything. Were you teaching math? Wow, very um, powerful, powerful clips. Um, I wanted to to just point out one of the things that stands out to me is just the the power of memory. How vivid um, both of these um, women can can describe those experiences um, desegregating schools as if it was yesterday. Um, I also think about the fact that they were black women um, during this time. Um, really true heroines. So I just want to um, again open the um, uh, questions up to um, the panelists to see if you all have any commentary on these clips. Sure, I'll start. I really enjoyed interviewing Dr. Mosby. Um, she was a real pioneer to desegregate high school faculty for Richmond Public Schools back then. And she was really desperately needed so much because Black children in their segregated elementary schools were in this cocoon, this nurturing womb, where you did have faces who looked like you and people telling you that you were bound to succeed and they were going to see you make it. And then they go to white schools where people just did not give them any sense of care or belonging. It was culture shock. And seeing uh, teachers like her was so reassuring. It was someone that you could connect to for support and encouragement while you were in this foreign territory. You know, there was another teacher at West Hampton Elementary School, Helen Winfrey Peyton Wallace. What was interesting about Helen as she became the first um, African American to uh, do this in the Richmond Public Schools on the elementary school side. She was very fair. She could pass for white. And it strikes me about issues of colorism and um, how white administrators began um, selecting teachers who could fit in that were either near white or not part of the black teacher network. You know, uh, and when they first started. Um, looking for faculty desegregation. Clearly, Carolyn is very self-authorized and very aware and sure of herself. That reminds me of another story that I heard from a um, very fair-skinned uh, teacher who went to Thomas Jefferson in the late um, 1960s, who said that he felt the school administration picked him and another guy because they weren't part of the Black Richmond Educator Network. Wow, you know, it, re it really makes me think of um, Virginia Union University because most teachers came out of that area and came out of Virginia Union from this area. And um, most teachers, once they graduated from Virginia Union, couldn't find work in, um, you know, the Richmond, Virginia area. Um, it brings me to, um, I, think, I think about my mother, I keep going back to my family because I was born and raised in this area. Um, and my mother went to Virginia Union, graduated from Virginia Union, and couldn't find work in, in, in the Richmond, Virginia area, and we grew up right around the corner from there. So she would go, and um, her and four other teachers would get in a car and drive to Goochland County, Virginia, so that they could do their student teaching and so that they can, could work. And it took her five years from the time she graduated in 1959 to find a job in the Richmond public school system. I do have one tidbit of information. I looked around and I found my mother kept all of her receipts from Virginia Union University. This was from one of her, um, where she had to pay to go to school. And this was dated 12-9-1953. And she paid $30 to um, go to school, and I believe she paid every week until she paid her dues to and her debt. So 
just wanted to share that tidbit of information. It's a great artifact. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, I um, was on this interview when, when Carmen did it, and I can just tell you that it was an, uh, it was an amazing interview. Dr. Mosby is a larger-than-life character and a larger-than-life person, and she's very inspiring. Well, I remember something from an interview that she said that, that, that really struck me, and she said that during that time that the Black teachers were the most educated teachers, and that was important. That's important because I heard the same thing from other teachers, particularly in my hometown. I never understood why uh, teachers who lived in my neighborhood had degrees, graduate degrees from places like New York University, um, Teachers College, uh, Columbia University, um, you know, other places, even, even Harvard. And it was because uh, Southern states sometimes paid the tuition of black students um, to go to Northern University so that they would not uh, try to desegregate Southern University. So um, her comment really made me think about, really made me think about that. And I think in uh, Virginia, it was called the Dobble Act, wasn't it, Carmen? Mm-hmm. In 1935. 1935. So um, uh, she's correct. Oftentimes, the Black teachers were the most educated teachers in these cities, in these districts, in these schools. You know, and I think that's in juxtaposition to the story that people normally think about where, where segregated black schools back then were just um, low quality and um, were just not uh, the kind of, of places and spaces where anybody would want to be educated. I think there's a paradox in that. While teachers did not have the resources, the schools did not have the resources, we had high quality educators yes. and segregation. Definitely. That's right. And Carolyn and, uh, and Laverne and uh, also uh, Mrs. Fullerwinder are, uh, demonstrate that kind of quality that's there. Yeah, they, they are what, um, what Tondra Loda Jackson calls in her book, uh, School Outs Activists, they were intellectual activists, right? Yes, yes. Yes. All right. Thank you so much, panelists, for that, that wonderful um, commentary. So we're going to move into our third segment, um, which is on pedagogy. So a major focus of the Teachers in the Movement project is our focus on um, what teachers taught and also how they taught. So in this clip, we're going to listen in as Mrs. Fullerwinder describes her teaching methods. So you taught biology and physical science. Physical science. What, what was your, your your method, your teaching method? How, how did you teach? Did you did you were you an uh, interactive teacher or were you a lecturer? I just like to know. It's just interesting. I, I, did, I did a variety. I did a lot of a lot of uh, hands on, a lot of independent uh, investigation because I had access to all of those microscopes, and I was able to put students in those small groups. And then there were times that I would lecture. I just did a combination of. Someone called to my attention a little bit later on that your teaching is so different from most of the teachers here. They do a lot of lecturing. I would go to the library until I develop a friendship with the librarian and ask if I could bring students into this uh, research certain topics at a certain time. And I got permission to do that. So we would go as a group to the library. We would do research. We would do some little mini, what I call mini field trips. To me, the campus was a vast area for exploration. So we'd go on the lawn and I would divide the lawn up into small sections and give an assignment for certain things that students were to find within that area and we'd come back in the classroom and discuss it. So I was constantly coming up with creative ways to make teaching interesting. And students seemed so interested in my classes. We were on a semester basis. The second semester, several of them who did not seem to like me when I first entered we're going to the guidance council to ask if they could be transferred to my guidance. Thank you. Uh, panelists, do you have um, any uh, commentary on listening to Mrs. Fullerwinder uh, describe her um, teaching methods, even thinking about the fact that she was a, a Black woman STEM teacher during this time period? Yeah, yeah. yes. Uh, I, uh, okay, I'll jump okay. in here. Um, 
I love this this interview with with Mrs. Fuller Winder because this part of the Teachers in the Movement project where we really hone in on teaching pedagogy really illustrates the bridge between history and teachers today and how we can begin to learn and utilize these stories in a practical way. And so in this clip, we're hearing her creative methods. Um, at the beginning of the interview, you hear her say all those microscopes that she had, which was <laughs> her really <laughs> saying, I didn't have access to these microscopes. So I had to figure out a way to teach these children with what little, these children with what little I had. And so we, we run into these, um, this, this theme here of what, no matter what context or what constraints that teachers have, there's a way where there's a will. And so I love that about um, Mrs. Fullerwinder and the way she get, begins to go into her um, very detailed, hands-on approach, going out into the schoolyard, making use of different things around the school. And, and, and I think that's really helpful as we think about that as educators today about things we can do within our context now. Yeah, I love this clip too. Uh, and, and one of the main reasons I like it, well, first of all, I just like Ms. Fullerwinder and, and as, as a teacher, but we don't know much about how teachers taught in the classroom during the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. We don't know much about their pedagogy. And so, she was excited when we asked her this question and she was able to recount very clearly uh, her teaching style, her teaching approach. And I remember asking her uh, if she was influenced at all by the work of John Dewey and experiential learning. And she said that, no, she said she doesn't remember being influenced by Dewey, but she said that it was just her teaching style. She was a very hands-on type of person. And I really liked the idea of her taking the students out on campus and doing experiments on, on campus uh, at the school. All of those were the types of teaching approaches that endeared her to her students. And she told me that uh, as time progressed, she became one of the most popular teachers at um, George Washington because of her teaching style. So that was a powerful uh, segment, I think. Alrighty, thank you again. Um, so we're going to transition into our final uh, segment. Um, and in it, we're going to focus on something that we're um, all familiar with, which is activism. So we're going to listen in as Dr. Owen Cardwell describes desegregating EC Glass High School in Lynchburg, um, Virginia as a student. And then we're going to return um, to Dr. Laverne Spurlock as she describes a lesser known form of teacher activism. What year did you enter uh, the then all white EC Glass High School? And can you remember the first day? January 29th, 1962. A day that shall live on in infamy. <laughs> um, um, yes, uh, actually, uh, the day before, uh, we had had a big snowstorm, and uh, uh, I don't know, I, uh, I think I was kind of hoping that maybe things got delayed a little bit, but, but we had been given a lot of preparation, um, so we were prepared for that day. We had gone through the entire summer with, with a meeting, um, potential classmates, meeting teachers, um, the, the then president of uh, Randolph-Macon uh, College hosted um, a dinner where we met with uh, representatives from the uh, student government. Um, um, I had been working in the tobacco fields in Connecticut as a summer job. And uh, my father had contacted me to come home because the, uh, we actually had to go through a court trial uh, that, the, uh, that we were needed back there for the, for the trial. I believe it's under Jackson et al. versus Lynchburg City Schools. Um, so we came back for that court trial. Um, and as I said, a lot of preparation had taken place. On that particular day, we were, we were advised. And so we came to school after the um, school bell had rung. Um, we were immediately taken to our homeroom, um, Linda Woodruff and I. Um, and um, there were actually four of the 
four of us that had to sue the school system. The truth of the matter is that initially there were 32 persons um, that had um, attended uh, a, a meeting at, uh, at Diamond Hill Baptist Church under, under Dr. Wood and offered the opportunity to, to participate in a class action suit against the school. Many of those uh, families, many of those children that were, um, that initially signed on, uh, economic pressure was applied to their uh, families to withdraw. And most of them depended upon the, um, the majority economy, you know, for their livelihood. Um, Brenda Hughes' mother was um, a local, uh, a waitress in a local restaurant, black owned restaurant. Um, Cecilia Jackson's father was a dentist. Um, um, Linda Woodruff's father uh, worked uh, for the Postal Service, but he uh, rode on the train back and forth between Lynchburg and Washington, D.C. And my father was the manager of a black insurance company. So they were not dependent uh, on that economy. And uh, when the uh, courts made the decision um, to desegregate the schools, they, they did something that I consider to be really arbitrary. They, they decided that based on supposed IQ scores that Linda and I could handle going in the middle of a school year. I want you to get it that this was January 29th, the middle of a school year, and that Brenda and Cecilia would come at the beginning of the next school year. But the truth of the matter is, is that all of us had IQ scores that were higher than probably 95% of the kids that we were going to be going to school with. And so uh, Linda and I be, uh, ended up being the, the first two, but I, you know, I give Brenda and Cecilia all the credit for, for being part of that. It was not their choice. Um, and so I, I consider them to be, um, you know, as much a part of the desegregation process as us. I'll tell you another example, though, of uh, uh, how people did move together in, in Richmond to keep things going. Uh, we had the organization, the Virginia Teachers Association, which was the separate entity from the Virginia Education Association. And the leader of that organization was Dr. J. Rupert Pikett. He came to us from, I think, the Newport News area. He had been involved in education there. He came here, took on the leadership of the Virginia Teachers Association, and made it move. Uh, the Virginia Teachers Association was the support for the Black teachers for a long time. You know, we think of men and women not making the same salary to do the same job. But put on to that, that Blacks did not make the same money either. And uh, it was through the Virginia Teachers Association and all the work that they did for so long that uh, Black teachers' salaries were equalized. And uh, that was a long struggle, a long, and I mean struggle. Another big thing that the Virginia Teachers Association did, and that was a good thing for teachers, they established a credit union. And uh, through that credit union, there were many people who were able to establish their credit because don't forget, banks wouldn't help you out. <laughs> and we had our bank, the Consolidated Bank and Trust Company, which was the force behind so many people getting a financial start, young couples trying to buy a home. But the credit union came along as another force and it came through the Virginia Teachers Association. It still exists. Although the Teachers Association has joined with the Virginia Education Association, the Teachers Credit Union still exists. Panelists, do you have uh, any comments on how these different forms of activism, both incredibly important and significant, contributed to the civil rights struggle in Virginia? Sure, I'll, um, 
I'll start off. I was fascinated listening to Owen Caldwell because um, one of the students that um, joined with him to desegregate EC last high school was Cecilia Jackson, as he mentioned, and her father was a Lynchburg dentist. Interestingly, um, activism was a family affair, and I think that that's always helpful to look at it in terms of a family perspective because um, Cece's cousin was French Jackson who desegregated Lane High School in Charlottesville. In fact, he was one of the Charlottesville 12. Um, the reason why I know this is because their fathers were friends of my father and all of them went to Howard University Dental School. So as I think about activism, I think about the power of networks and the sense of mission and commitment to where the goals are and the strivings are. And clearly they had it. Um, many black health professionals and black business owners and people that work for the federal government who were not beholden to whites for their livelihoods were often at those front lines to support the movement. And also with their children in roles of sacrificial lambs for the cause. So you could see generationally how each one was teaching one for the next generation to keep that fervor and that hope alive. Um, when I heard um, Dr. Laverne Spurlock talk about um, J. Uh, Rupert Pika, you know, he was fired from the um, Newport News school system because he promoted equal pay for the teachers back there. And he was also, when he became the uh, president of the Virginia Teachers Association, he was the one that called for an economic boycott after the Richmond 34, the students from Virginia Union, were arrested for their sit-in at Tallheimer's. When we think about activism and the results, you know, Tallheimer's department store lost over $8 million in sales from the basement section alone where most black shopped. So that sense of activism and that passion I think spread out throughout that whole network of, of VTA teachers. Uh, um, I also know that um, my uncle Skip was um, the first executive director for the teachers union and he had worked at Consolidated Bank. He earned an MBA from Boston University like Professor Aldrich talked about. Many Virginians got a graduate education thanks to the state of Virginia because they didn't want to desegregate the universities, but he was also the treasurer of the Richmond NAACP for 40 years. So you could see this tight network of activists between teachers, people that were involved in the NAACP and supporting things that were crucial and important for the next generation. Yeah, Carmen, I will, I will follow up after that. I think that's very good. I, I remember interviewing Owen Cardwell, thinking about your remarks on him. And Dr. Cardwell's personality is larger in life. And I just remember sitting there and I could hardly ask a question because he is literally a walking encyclopedia. He remembers the details of every single thing. And I think that interview is such a powerful one to show today to demonstrate the power, the power and importance of oral history and how you can get the in-between that you can't get from just reading a history book. Because when I sat in that room and talked to him and he would recall how he felt, who trained him, what the preparation was like, all of these great figures in Lynchburg, Virginia from Diamond Hill Baptist Church and other historic historical um, important things, it was really powerful in knowing man, I'm getting, um, I'm getting something that I wouldn't be able to get otherwise other than talking to him in this moment. And I think you could get a little bit of that in that clip that we had as he went through the details a little bit, but I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed that interview with him. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I enjoyed the inter both interviews, but the one interview that struck out and stuck out most to me was Dr. Spurlock's interview. As she talked about um, the credit unions, and she talked about Consolidated Bank, which was the is well was the bank in in Richmond, Virginia, founded by Magdalena Walker, first African American female to be the president of a bank. Me being a financial advisor by trade, that I love money. So knowing that African Americans still have financial um, problems and 
and we are discriminated against, it really, really was prevalent back in when Dr. Spurlock was a teacher. And the credit unions, the teacher credit unions were a godsend to teachers and to the administration there. Um, during the 1950s and 60s, they were treated unfairly, discriminated against for loans, even though they had stellar credit scores, and which mortgage loans was one of them, started, that started the Fair Credit Act back in 1968. The teacher credit unions were there to give them security so that they can put their money in a bank and know that the money will be there when they wanted to take it out, as well as they knew that they weren't gonna get abused or exploited and they would be being treated fairly. Well, I can also give you the story, some stories of some of my clients who are retired school teachers. And when I say that they, were, they are well off and they're living pretty and nice, they were able to save enough money so that when they retired, they were able to just sit back, relax, and enjoy retirement life without having to um, work and be unsecure. So I think those, those things, Dr. Spurlock spoke about resilience and the resiliency that she spoke about and that she had, as well as all of the teachers, made the students resilient. And that's one of the reasons why some of us and most of us are the way we are today. All right, panelists, thank you so, so much for that incredibly rich discussion um, that we just had. Um, we're, what we're gonna do now is turn um, to our Q&A segment um, because I'm sure the audience has plenty of questions um, they want to, to ask you all. And um, for those of you who haven't already, um, please enter your questions or comments into the Q&A feature and please leave your name and any affiliation you have as well. So our first question came in from Isaiah. Um, he asked early on in the webinar, so it appears many civil rights movements were started by youth. Why? That's a good question. Hmm. I, think, I think some of it is just as simple as uh, they had a evolving and different worldview than their parents and their grandparents. Number two, they had the energy as well. So you know, just those two things. And they were supposed to, 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 to more, you know, to more ideas, right? So uh, if you think about the generation of um, teachers who came through during the 1960s, they were exposed to different ideas than teachers who came along in the 1920s. So, you know, I'm often asked, what was it about the teachers in the 1950s and 60s that made them different. I think it was just the society was opening up uh, for young people in a way uh, during that period that it had in an earlier period. So I think context means um, everything as well. So um, our colleague Derek from Asala Richmond asks, um, and pardon any mispronunciations here, according to Paulo Ferry in the Pedagogy of the Oppressed, quote, those truly committed to liberation must reject the banking concept of its entirety, end quote. How do, we how do we use teachers in the movement to transform public education to help present day teachers develop a sense of consciousness and understanding for the importance of telling these narratives? Well, that's kind of a, 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 a Practical and uh, practical and pragmatic question that that we think about all the time. So let me just say that every summer we hold a teachers institute, and we bring in teachers um, from across Virginia who are teaching now to work with us uh, on the oral histories that we've collected over the years. We give them training in oral history methods, and we have conversations with them about what they viewed in these videos. But we also devote one day to having a forum of sorts where we have a panel discussion and we allow uh, the teachers to ask them any question, contemporary teachers to ask them any questions about things that they're struggling with in the classroom in terms of their pedagogy. The issue of banking, the banking concept that you mentioned uh, by Paulo Freire, that comes up. 
and it's it, it, it's really a spiritual. It's been a spiritual experience for me to watch these teachers across generations. Someone who's teaching in 2019 to ask a teacher like uh, Dr. Spurlock, you know, how can I reach these kids? They're very difficult to reach. Uh, they don't seem to want to know much about Black history. And Dr. Le Laverne Spurlock, I remember her saying, "Take one at a time." If you can't teach all of them at the same, just take one at a time. And over time, you'll get some momentum and the other um, uh, students will come along. So um, we have that actual video on the Teachers in the Movement website, if anyone wants to see it. So uh, that's what we have to do. We have to put them in conversation with one another. I would agree. Um with Professor Aldridge, um, that it does, it's one at a time, particularly because we're in a, we've been in a different environment as we shifted from segregated schools to desegregated schools to presumably integrated schools that are still now desegregated. We've lost some generations, in my view, that um, where we were able to pass the baton um, more directly because we had, um, as, as black teachers, there was agency over black students. Now with things being integrated, I think that um, people are anxious about what to say and what not to say, or sometimes suppressed by what it is they can say to their students. Um, during segregated um, schooling in the 50s, uh, black teachers could have conversations with their students because they were also part of that community. Whereas now when we look at schooling, there is a difference because many times um, African American children, children of color, are not taught by people that are connected to their cultural background. But that doesn't mean that the advocacy can't happen. We have to be creative to consider it in different ways so that we're using that history that we know is important to convey to the next generation. It may not be necessarily schooling. It may be in how we interface with our communities differently, nonprofit organizations, and really push with technology available that we didn't have back in an earlier era. How do we begin to focus? And again, like Dr. Spurlock said, how do you begin to start out with, with at least one and then build that exponentially? That takes leadership. Yep. Thank you. So our colleague, Dr. Williams from the Batten School of Public Policy and Leadership asks, are the teachers in the movement oral histories and video clips available to the public? If not, are there any plans for granting access to the public in particular primary, secondary, and post-secondary students. These clips are powerful. They allow you to appreciate how the past has a presence in the uh, present. They give students a better sense of contemporary challenges that lie at the intersection of equity, social justice, and social policy. Um, yes, I think right now we have a little over 50 of the interviews posted on the Teachers in the Movement website. We'll continue to post um, additional videos this summer through the end of the year. So um, yes, uh, if, you, is there, if there's a particular video that you would like to see um, that's not posted, uh, please just email us and um, we can grant you um, permission to see it or we can give you access to it. So yeah, we want these interviews, we don't want these interviews to be stale and to sit in an archive and not be used. We want them to be used um, for historical purposes, but we also want them to have a contemporary relevance or uh, a practical application aspect to them. So just please email us if you if there's something you think we might have in our in our collection. So the next question um, uh, as a former white teacher from a large school district in Florida, one of my prior schools had a very strong and effective African American female principal, as well as an African American female assistant principal. The student population was only about 10% African American. 
The principals seemed to be much tougher on the African American students when it came to behavior, and she made it clear that she expected more from them. Do you have any inkling on how teachers in these interviews handled their students, both black and white? Well, I, we, we haven't asked the um, uh, teachers a, qu uh, a question regarding what the, um, this person just, just raised, but uh, we do know that black teachers expected black students to perform at very high levels. Uh, I would venture to say that that's not only in the past, but in the present too. So um, yes, I, I, I can agree with that um, based on you know, just kind of tangentially what people have said in our interviews, but that's not a question that we ask them directly. Um, my other colleagues may have uh, some input in that, regarding that. No, I think that's right, Professor Allridge. Um, I think that's exactly right. The only other thing that comes to mind is Mrs. Fullerwinder's interview, I, I'm pretty sure, where she discusses that she kind of removed race in her classroom and tried to teach um, all of the students, you know, equally and with as much fervor and excitement as she could. Um, but I think that you're right in that um, the expectations were high from, from these Black educators, especially for, for, for all of their students, really. Yeah. Great. Um, the next question was a reference to something that a panelist mentioned uh, in the beginning of the webinar. What was the name of the book or textbook that was mentioned at the beginning of the interviews in reference to what's being used in the classroom? Another attendee thought it was the Carter G. Woodson Negro Retold. Story of the Negro Retold. I think Michelle talked about that one. Um, what year was it published, Michelle? Do you remember? It was published in 1935. Right. Um, you probably can find it in a lot of the university bookstores. Um, I looked at it online a few um, hours ago, and there they have one um, for $150 on eBay. So <laughs> they're very expensive. So I'm not sure where you can find it. I know that I found um, a copy of it online. Um, at a university. And, and, and I mentioned also another book by Woodson called Negro Makers of History, which was published in 1928. Thank you. Another question came in um, from someone from Henrico County Public Schools. I noticed that a common thread among the teachers was having a network of support during their tenure as educators. I think that Black teachers today are drained largely due to our internalizing the impact the system has on African-American students' success or lack thereof. I don't know that we feel entirely supported or if schools empathize with us in that regard. Are there similar organizations operating for Black teachers today? Yeah, I hear you, because uh, teachers certainly had uh, some support, black teachers did. I'm thinking about, you know, the um, uh, ATA, the Palmetto Teachers Association in South Carolina, which was the Black Teachers Association, uh, and whatnot. So there were many black teachers association, which um, provided great support, not only um, uh, curriculum support, but support also as it pertained to uh, legal issues as well. So I'm not aware of an uh, organization that focuses, no, I have, yes, I am. There's an organization called the National Alliance for Black School Educators. So I would encourage you, um, my brother is a principal and he talks about that organization a lot. And I've been to a few of their conferences, but it is uh, a very strong organization that focuses on the experiences of um, African-American educators. So I would, I, would, I would send you to their website. I would also think that in addition to formal organizations like you uh, suggested, um, Professor Aldridge, um, if you don't see one, how can you be a source for change? How can you begin to 
again, thinking about um, Dr. Laverne Spurlock's um, suggestion, how do you start with one? How do you begin to build informal networks that may grow as, as you and other um, educators begin to talk about the stresses? Because there is a real serious need in our communities to focus on self-care and uh, how particularly for those educators, women and men, who can begin to ask themselves, what do they need to take care of themselves so that they can garner the resilient strategies that they need to keep hope alive, not just for the kids, but for themselves, because these are really difficult times. We're not only experiencing challenges within our education system that were built on a foundation of um, inequality for decades. But now, I know Richmond Public Schools um, it became 150 years old as a dual school system. Um, and we haven't celebrated Richmond Public Schools birthday yet, but it's been 150 years of a dual school system trying to merge it into one and the struggles that have come with that. Um, teachers are um, the lifeblood of our children. And we can see that right now while we're dealing with COVID, that not having those teachers in place, I hope parents have a real respect for how important teachers are. And this is Teacher Appreciation Week, by the way. So um, how you honor and take care of yourselves and ask yourself, what can you do and how do you reach out to others to say, I need help. I need some love and attention and I've got to reframe this so I can keep moving forward. Thank you. So we have another question um, from Roberta. Uh, within the last four days, I spoke with a parent who had students in a Chesterfield Public High School and another parent who had two students in an An Handover High School who had no Black teachers during their entire time in high school. These students are now in college. What can we do now to assure students of color are able to have teachers who look like them? It's a very important question. Uh, the Curry School of Education has done some important work in this area. And um, from some of the studies that have been conducted here, we've shown that the race of a teacher does matter with students and that uh, African-American students benefit from having African-American teachers. Uh, we all knew that, right? Um, so what we have to do now is encourage uh, African-Americans to go into the field of teaching. And that's been um, a hard sell. So moving forward, uh, I work, um, I direct a center called the Center for Race and Public Education in the South. And we're in the process of trying to uh, develop a program uh, around research uh, regarding how to recruit more African Americans into the teaching profession so that our African American children can have more African American teachers because it, it really does make a difference. And that's re based on the research. So we would welcome any other questions or comments from attendees or panelists as well. So another question um, from our colleague, Dr. Williams at the Batten School. Considering the impact and disruption of the COVID-19 pandemic on primary and secondary education and instruction, do you see the collection and utilization of oral histories by these students as a viable option for them to play an active and engaged role in learning and appreciating history? <laughs> Good question. We're just talking about that with a colleague of mine who works in the Center for Race and Public Education in the South. And uh, we don't, we, we want to eventually move to a place where we're training uh, young people to do these oral histories. Uh, this summer, 
uh, the center that I just spoke about is going to hold at, host a freedom school that's uh, sponsored by the Children's Defense Fund. A part of the Children's Defense Fund, uh, a part of our curriculum for that freedom school will be to train uh, young children or students rather from grades three to five in methods of oral history. And they will be doing this, uh, you know, between June and the end of July. So yes, yes, we want to train people how to do this. We don't want to be the only individuals doing this research on, on teachers and educators. And so we're trying to develop ways to, 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 get, to get young people involved. And let me just add too, that it has become more difficult for us to conduct interviews in this COVID-19 environment, but we're doing them uh, via phone and we're doing them on Zoom because we just can't wait. So we're, 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 we're really pushing forward with the project despite the circumstances we're on at this, at this moment. So another question and pardon again, any mispronunciations. Um, are you actively assisting with preserving the Rosenwald School of Virginia and the oral histories of students and teachers involved? Uh, no, not, not, not in an active way, but that's something that we have thought about, but not in an active way, we, we have not. We've been focused primarily on um, preserving the narratives of teachers, so. I can lead into that and um, Asala Richmond started, um, we formed in late 2019 and we have reached out to a few of the Rosenwald schools. Unfortunately, COVID-19 happened. So we were not able to meet and to discuss to see how we can assist. But once this pandemic is over, Asala Richmond will be active in the Rosenwald schools here in the central Richmond, Virginia area, and even in the Virginia area if they need our help. Please feel free to add any additional questions or comments or panelists, you're welcome to do the same. Um, we have a comment from um, um, a colleague, Jim, here. This is great work, a wonderful contribution to school desegregation history. Thank you. You know, one, one observation I might make as um, someone who's been doing these oral histories and who also has lived from childhood to adulthood, now to elderhood, um, through the movement is um, how priceless educators are in your role over your, your, your life stages. Uh, because that's how you learn not only about um, intellectual and academics, but that's also how you learn about life. And I would um, suggest that it's important for us to connect as much as we can with those that are older, that, because that's where we also gain not only the stories, but the wisdom. You know, one of the things that I'm fascinated about in the work that I do is how do we use history so that we can begin to look at trends and patterns as we look at, let's say, public policy issues, for example. Um, how can we ask ourselves, is this the road that we need to go down? Have we done this before? What were the lessons learned? How can we uh, do something that um, uses some of the frameworks of uh, what, what, I, what I've, I've been learning about in terms of adaptive leadership? and try new and different things to determine how you can make um, a space in something that you don't know how to, how to do, but to begin to try to do it. When I listen to the wisdom of the elders and some of the things about making a way out of no way, I think it's really important for us now to ask ourselves, how do we have the courage to lead? How do we have the courage to do things 
that are not what has always been done in the past, but how do we have the courage to have some wisdom behind us so that we can venture out for the present and the future? Yes. So let me just say this too, before we conclude, and that is that we are seeking individuals to interview. Um, we're not allowing this uh, COVID-19 to stop us. As I said earlier, we are conducting interview phone interviews. We are conducting interviews on Zoom and uh, you know other platforms. So if you know of someone that you believe we should contact, that we should interview, please uh, send your information to us. Uh, Leslie can provide uh, in the chat um, the address, the email address. It may be on this well on a slide, but if you provide that for for people, Leslie, that would would be greatly appreciated. But please email us. We've uh, during our last webinar, we had a number of individuals to email us, and we've already set up interviews. Um, from you know, recommendations that we received from our last interview. So thanks a lot. This concludes our second Teachers in the Movement discussion in our webinar series. We'd like to extend our sincere, sincere thanks to everyone for joining us here today. We are especially thankful to our co-sponsors, again, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, Asala Richmond Organizing Branch, uh, Asala of Central uh, Virginia, Desegregation of Education, Dove, um, of Virginia Education Dub, AARP Virginia. Uh, please be sure to follow us on social media at teachersinthemovement.com and use hashtag, hashtag Tim Webinar Series. Please also visit our website, as I mentioned, teachersinthemovement.com uh, for more interviews and our first webinar in the video library. Be sure to be on the lookout for our next webinar in this series. We hope you will join us again. Thank you. <laughs>